Good day, everyone. My name is Jeff Steves, and on this episode of Flying Physics, we're going to be talking about the turn radius equation. What it is, where it comes from, especially that weird 11.26 in the bottom of it, but also why we'd want to use it and ways we can make it even simpler to make it more useful for us in the cockpit. So let's get started. <music> Okay, so imagine you are setting off on a mountain flight. You're going to be heading through some canyons and depending on the weather and the situation, you may have to turn around and come back to a safe airport to land in, maybe in a precautionary scenario or something like that. So I'm going to start at my home base here in Victoria. We're going to take off and we're going to head over uh, towards Vancouver and up towards Squamish and into the mountains towards Whistler. So we're flying along and we come towards Pemberton here and now we're getting into an area where canyons start to become a little bit narrower, the terrain is coming up and imagine you're in a situation where you're flying in this region and the weather is deteriorating. You may have to turn around. Uh, look at this little area here. Are we going to be able to turn around safely and return back towards Pemberton if the weather is deteriorating? To understand this, we can make use of the radius equation. Now, the radius equation has several terms, and in order to understand where this equation comes from, we have to learn a little bit about turning an aircraft and what are the forces involved. So what I've got here is a model of a little Cessna aircraft showing two important forces that are going to affect our turn. I'll just uh, rotate the aircraft here and what you can see is there's a green arrow and that's showing the force of the weight of the aircraft, gravity acting on the aircraft, as well as this red arrow which is showing the lift uh, generated by the wing of the aircraft. Now uh, if we look head on we can see that the weight down is equal and opposite to the lift and the aircraft is able to fly along and maintain altitude. But if we roll the aircraft now, what we can see here is although the length of this red lift arrow has stayed the same, the portion of that lift acting along the y-axis in the vertical direction here has actually diminished. And instead we have, or in addition, we have a new x component to the lift shown here. We can rotate our model around and see those arrows. And so what I'm showing here is the main lift vector here along with the vertical and horizontal components of lift. Now the vertical component of lift still has to keep the aircraft up in the air. We don't want to descend in this turn. So what that means is we actually have to increase that vertical component of lift by pitching the aircraft nose up a little bit like that until the new vertical component is equal and opposite to the weight. And with this configuration, now we have this horizontal component of lift here. And this horizontal component of lift is going to be what actually turns the aircraft. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to move over to my tablet and write down some equations and see how we can use this lift, the vertical component and the horizontal component, to work out the turn radius for an aircraft. So moving to the tablet, I'm going to draw our aircraft just as a point here. I'm going to draw a dashed line along the y-axis and I'm going to draw a lift vector acting at some angle theta. So in your calculator, if I rolled the aircraft to 45 degrees, you'd, you'd put theta is equal to 45 degrees. You can calculate the sine of that angle or the cosine or whatever. Now the weight is going to act straight down like this. And the weight of an aircraft is just its mass times the gravitational constant g, 9.8 meters per second squared, for instance. Now, if this is the y-axis and this is the x-axis, uh, we can write along the y-axis. The vertical component of lift is just going to be L times the cosine of theta. 
and that is going to be equal to the weight of the aircraft, assuming that the pilot has rolled the aircraft to some bank angle and applied enough back pressure such that the aircraft is going to maintain altitude. So L cos theta is going to equal the aircraft's weight, uh, and we can rewrite the lift as being equal to the weight divided by the cosine of theta. As you roll an aircraft to a larger and larger bank angle, you need more overall lift in order to keep the aircraft from descending. Now, along the x-axis or along the horizontal, we have the horizontal component of lift, which is just L times the sine of theta, and that is going to be equal to something kind of special. So I've got my aircraft model here, and what we're going to do as pilots is roll our aircraft to a bank angle of, say, 45 degrees, um, apply some back pressure, and execute our 180 degree turn. Now if we do a perfect circular turn from one direction to its reciprocal to the other direction, then the amount of force, the horizontal component of force, has to have a specific value. And that value is actually m, the mass of the aircraft, times v squared divided by r. If we apply too much force, our turn is going to spiral in. And if we apply not enough force, we're not going to make a good turn at all. It's not going to be circular. So imagine if we apply too much force, we're going to be kind of spiraling in like that. Not enough, we're going to kind of go off like this. If we apply just the right amount of force, we'll move the aircraft around in a circle. Okay, now that's the amount of force, and that's the centripetal force uh, required for circular motion when we're flying in a circle at a constant speed with a constant radius. And if we apply just that amount of force, then what we can do is use this value of lift in here, and we get mg over the cosine of theta times the sine of theta is equal to this special amount of force required for a circle. The m's on both sides of this equation cancel. Sine theta over cos theta is just equal to the tangent of our angle, and we get that is equal to v squared over r. The radius of our turn is just going to be equal to v squared over g times the tangent of theta. In the aircraft, what do we fly with? We fly with nautical miles per hour, and we fly um, uh, distances typically in nautical miles or feet. To make this equation work for us, we're going to do some unit conversions. We're going to take our speed, and we want to be able to uh, input a speed in nautical miles per hour. And uh, in order for this to work, uh, our radius will be in feet, and uh, we're going to use a g in units of feet uh, per second squared. Okay, so there's a few conversion factors, and I'll just show you those quick. So everywhere we have a v, we have to multiply it by a conversion factor. So our speed v times 6,080 feet per nautical mile, that's going to help us convert from nautical miles to feet. Uh, we're going to have to multiply this by one hour, which is the same as 3,600 seconds. And if we square all of this and we implement our g, uh, now g, is typically written in meters per second squared, so we want to write it in feet per second squared, so we'll multiply by 3.28 feet per meter, and we still have our tan theta term. If we do all of this conversion, now look with v, uh, everything's getting squared. The conversion factors themselves actually have to be squared, so we get v squared in the numerator, and I'm just going to write everything over in the denominator. And we can do this, we get uh, g, we'll use 9.79, multiply by 3.28, multiply by 3600 times 3600, divided by 6080 times 6080, all of this times 1 over the tangent of theta. Looks like a big mess, and, and it is, uh, so what we're going to do is we'll just use our calculator to calculate that. So I've put it all in here. I just hit enter and it gives us 11.26. So our equation for turn radius is that r is equal to v squared over 11.26 times the tangent of theta.
Okay, so all of that stuff goes into the conversion factor. Now, the people who created this formula news 9.79 uh, meters per second squared as the acceleration due to gravity. In physics, uh, we often use 9.8, 9.81, uh, and it's gonna depend on where you are on Earth. So to use this equation, and just to do a quick example, we'll uh, consider a turn where we have a 45 degree bank angle, and we have a ground speed of 105 knots. So we put that in, uh, we have um, 105 squared divided by 11.26 times the tangent of 45 degrees, and that gives us uh, 979 feet for our turn radius. Remember the diameter of the turn is gonna be twice the radius, so the diameter would be approximately uh, 2,000 feet. Then you can go to your chart and actually see whether that's going to be a problem for you, depending on the altitude that you're flying at and the width of a, of a valley, for instance. And this is all good. Uh, but if you're doing canyon turns in a valley, uh, first of all, you're not necessarily going to have a calculator with you. You have to kind of do these calculations beforehand. Uh, but there is a way that we can make the equation a little bit easier to use so that you could probably use it uh, in flight and calculate it in your head. So our starting point is r is equal to v squared over 11.26 times the tangent of your bank angle. If we turn, turns at uh, 45 degree bank, uh, well, the tangent of 45 degrees is equal to 1. So a simple version that's going to give us approximately the right answer is that r is approximately equal to speed squared. Now 11.26, you're not going to be able to do math with that in your head, so we'll just simplify this as 10. And if we're turning at 45 degrees, the tangent of 45 is 1, so we have just v squared over 10 as a simple version of your turn radius equation that you could just use in the cockpit anytime you're doing a 45 degree bank turn. Now remember with your bank angle, uh, at higher bank angles, your load factor is going to go up. And at 45 degrees, your load factor is gonna be about 1.4. Your stall speed goes up with the square root of the load factor. So just be aware of that. You're gonna have about a 20% higher stall speed at this 45 degree bank angle. But just for some simple exercises here, if our speed is 150 knots, 150 squared uh, is gonna be about 22,500 divided by 10. So you expect a turn radius about 2250 feet. Uh, at 100 knots, this is gonna be about 10,000 divided by 10, so 1,000 feet. And if we go down to about 80 knots, just so the math is easy, R is gonna be about 6,400 divided by 10, so 640 feet. So these are some examples of using the simplified turn radius equation. If you're flying, V squared over 10. If you're on the ground, V squared over 11.26 tangent of the bank angle. If you want to know more about steep turns and canyon turns and the turn radius equation, go to your local flying club and uh, meet with a flight instructor. You can go through this in more detail. That's all for now. Uh, thank you and have a good day.